Good evening and welcome. Crikey, what a busy schedule we have got here on Leicester Fan TV. Obviously, we had live action last night all the way from the Emirates. Tonight, I am so, I genuinely am, genuinely, genuinely so excited because tonight on uh, tonight's Fox's Tail Show, we've got the one and only Mr. Brian Little. Now, honestly, so many games, magical, magical Leicester games, some of the best games in my life. Uh, with Brian Little in charge. So I want to get your questions in, your comments in, whatever you want to ask Brian Little tonight, now is your chance to ask it in your Fox's Tail show. Yep, yeah, good evening. Welcome to the Fox's Tale Show. Get a few comments in. David Hart, good evening to you. David, what would you like to ask Brian Little? Same to you, Matty Bond is watching, and Amanda, and Simon May. Lots of people watching. What I want to know is get your questions in. Ross, we will come on to that question. Why did he leave Leicester? I know we are going to ask that one, but let's come. Let's start off by bringing in Brian Little. Brian, good evening. Hi there, you're all right. Good to speak to you. Are you okay? Brilliant. I Genuinely, I, I am excited about tonight chatting with you because uh, I've watched Leicester since the 70s and right up to the winning the Premier League. So I've seen the good and the bad. But your era, from for me, was one of the most exciting uh, Leicester eras there was. There's some fantastic games we're going to talk about. Um, you obviously, you, I, I want to start off just before you came to Leicester, you, you were... You, you were starting your managerial career sort of at, at Darlington and then yes. um, where well, you did well at Darlington. You won the fourth division, I believe. Yeah, I won the conference. I won two championships two years in a row, yeah. So I won the conference and uh, and then divis the old Division 4, as it was in them days. So, yeah, it's a really, really great grounding in many respects. You know, I mean, uh, uh, learned to... Learned to um, to do all the work that you needed to do as a manager and more, in all fairness, at, at that level. Um, you know, you no training grounds. So we used to have to train on, on parks pitches. So we used to have to, you know, clean the dog muck off before the, <laughs> before he trained and everything. It was so, it was very, it was, yeah, it was a, a real grounding thing for me. And uh, going to a club like Leicester was a massive step up for me, you know. Um, so uh, it, it was a big step, but one that I felt I was ready for. Do you think some of the modern day managers sometimes who who are ex players get shoved in straight to like manage Arsenal or somebody? Do you think Crikey, they've just not earned that badge yet? Really, maybe sometimes to. Um, it's to... it's a diff it's a different way of doing things. I mean, in back in my day, I spent sort of eight years as coaching youth teams and reserve teams, watching football matches, going out doing scouting. I I, I understand the fact that. Nowadays, they don't need to do that. You know, they now have technical directors, directors of football who do most of the scouting, chief scouts. You can watch games within your own area. You know, the, the, the footage they can get hold of games on now is, is unreal. So basically, the, the, it's two completely different eras. You know, I needed to yeah. do groundwork. Nowadays, you know, you have a backup staff um, who, 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 who do everything for you. You know what I mean? Back in the day, I generally had two or three people working with me, and we did everything. So it's yeah. uh, it's a completely different ball game these days. And then what? I mean, you were quite young when you you came to Leicester. What what sort of enticed you into into Leicester? Because I think you were at Borough, weren't you? Yeah, I I was working at Middlesbrough as the youth team coach. I'd had a, a very I think I had six games at Wolverhampton Wanderers as a caretaker manager about five years prior to that. Um, uh, but then I was sacked after winning two games in a row. So uh, I was happy to, to join Bruce Rioch at Middlesbrough. But I always said to Bruce, you know, if I, if I can learn enough off you, Bruce, one day I want to be a manager. I've just had a taste of it. I wasn't ready for it, but I, I wanted to do. I had three brilliant years with Bruce Rioch and Colin Todd at Middlesbrough. I went from the third division to the second division to the first division. And then I, I, I went in. Uh, knocked on Bruce's door and said, look, I've got to go. I've, I've got to be a football manager. I have a job lined up or anything. Uh, I just felt I had to do it. You know, it was time to go. Um, fortunately, within sort of a week or two weeks, I was offered an opportunity at Darlington, which is just down the road. They were bottom of the old fourth division at the time. Um, couldn't save them, but I did enough in, the, in a two-month spell to impress them. And um, on the back of that, was given a two-year deal to get them back in the Football League. Of course, I did it first year. And then won the championship in the fourth division the second year. So um, it was a it was a bit of a rocky path into it, but I'd done a lot of groundwork and I felt I was ready for it. So um, 
it, 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 Middlesbrough was great for me. Bruce Rioch was a is a great mentor of mine, and um, but a lot of my teams were based on Ron Saunders, who was my manager, of course, in the seventies. So there's a mixture of all sorts of things that went in there. Yeah, yeah, and obviously when you came to Leicester, um, we'd just had we'd we'd had quite again. This is partly why I know your book terrible is was called. Yes, yeah. it was terrible. I mean, yeah. we, one of the most uh, another massive memorable game because we just escaped relegation. But yeah. generally, we'd we'd had a lot of dross years leading up to that, and we, we'd almost earned the right yeah. to get relegated. So when you yeah. came in, it really was a breath of fresh air. Well. What I did, I actually, when I'd signed uh, the op- the opportunity with with Martin George to go to the club, he gave me the video of the year before, and it was only then that I sort of watched the the, the goals that had been conceded and everything else. Um, I'd had a reputation in that very short time at Darlington of of putting together a team that gave very little away, but was was quite exciting going forward. I don't think people a lot was more was said about the defensive side of the game than the attacking side because I played with three centre backs, which was a little bit out of the norm at the time. So I think a few people thought that I was coming as a as someone who who would play very defensive because of this three centre back thing, yeah. but I always tried to get two strikers in my team who were the focal point of the team very much. The, and my motto was very much to my team: keep your strikers in the game of football. Make sure they enjoy playing. Being an ex striker myself, I used to hate odd games that you didn't get involved with. You know, if you were under the caution, and, and yet you were still an outball. So my philosophy was very much about keeping your strikers in the game, even though I, I, I work very hard about defensive players. So um, I had a nice mix. And, um, you know, that first season, I think there was sort of 19 transfers in and out. So I went straight at it. You know, there was no messing around. Yeah. Um, got the system into place um, uh, and, 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 and basically got off the ground running. I mean, it, it, was, it was a better start than I could ever have imagined that first little period. Um, so, you know, but, but my philosophy was very much there about being hard to beat, but try yeah. and play good football. Don't, don't ever forget about playing good attacking football. Well, it certainly was good football. I've got a question from one of the Leicester fans. We've got loads watching, Brian. One of them is, what, what is your favourite or happiest memory of Filbert Street? Before you answer that, I'm going to say one of mine ever there, I watched <laughs> many years there, was Cambridge playoff final yeah. in that first year of yours, 5-0, ooh, Tommy Wright. What a... Yeah. Oh. So, but well, that's uh, mine. But listen, uh, Filbert Street at a night match. I was always—I mean, I'd played at Filbert Street many times, and I'd had a, a few. I always knew it was a good place to go to. But Filbert Street as a manager on a night match w- was a brilliant atmosphere. I loved it. You know, we were all set up for it. And bearing in mind that season we'd lost five-one at Cambridge yeah. early in the season, and I got a right load of stick on the bus afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were banging, the fans were banging the side of the bus. And I remember thinking to myself, what have I done? To you? <laughs> yeah. It was like the first time I'd had a bit of stick in a, as a manager sort of thing. But, you know, it was probably justified. Um, but Cambridge were an unbelievably difficult side to play against, you know. So yeah. I, I agree with you. And I've said it on many occasions. The Cambridge game is probably one of my favourite games of, of, of the three years that I was there. I love the atmosphere. I've watched the the thing back a few times, time and time again, yeah. to get the, the feel. And I loved every minute of it. And I, you know, you you see little things. I remember Rooster heading it in now, and and it was, yeah. you know, a, a bit of a lad to say the least. You know, in my time there, it was hard work to look after Rooster, but he was, yeah, a real talent. Tommy was brilliant, of course. Yeah. And then I had to deal with you know Walshie being as fiery as he was, and learn to <laughs> to deal with that sort of thing. It was a massive step, but but yes, I, I, I have to agree with you. The, the, the Cambridge game was genuinely one of my favourites. Um, uh, it was a brilliant night, and to have beaten a team, and, and in, in effect, I think John Beck had been uh, interviewed before me for the job, um, uh, but it was, given, yes. it, was given, it was given to me. So to have got one over on John, I think it proved Martin had made the right choice in the end. So it was a little bit of a... Uh, 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 it was something that I was very pleased with, to say the least, you know. And uh, and again, 1991, uh, going to 92, that playoff final, which was Blackburn. Again, for most Leicester fans, we haven't been to Wembley since 1969. I'd never, ever been. So, uh, as you know a what, fan... Yeah, you know what? We, we'd beaten Blackburn twice in the season as well. I know. That was Did something we... that I... 
I did that was something I hadn't really realised till quite a long time afterwards. You know, and I, I, I remember thinking Blackburn were favourites when we went into that game. In fact, they were by then. That yes. The Walker, Jack Walker, the money, money had, had come in. in. But, but, at the, but earlier in that season, I'm, I'm, conv- I'm I would love to check it, but I'm convinced we 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 beat them both games that well, season in the league. Brian, I'm going so to ask Leicester fans. Them, I'm going to ask yeah. Leicester fans who are watching if that is is that the season that Rooster scored one nil away at Blackburn because I was at that game late on in the yeah. game and it was it was a bit I'm of I'm sure ball. it was one nil away and I think we yeah. beat them three three nil at home that's that's what's hitting me and I'm I have to say 29 years on and now 66 yeah. my memory <laughs> my memory sometimes lets me down a little bit you know but uh, I, I'm convinced we beat them twice but by the time we got to the final they were well and truly the favourites to to win that particular match and. It, it almost was a bit of a day out, you know, which is a, a sort of strange thing to say. You know, we didn't, we couldn't believe we'd got there. But, yeah. You know, bear in mind, we the season before, almost, yeah, because the season before was so poor. Um, uh, we had a, we, as ever, we had some good runs and little bad areas in in the season. Um, obviously, the March time, um, I think I made the massive decision to move Kitson out, but brought in four yes. players. You know, I think. I, I, again, I, I remember signing G, Phil G and Ormondroy from Derby, and I think it allowed me to. I had money out in the pot as well, which gave me the opportunity to sign Simon Grayson and, and Michael Whitlow. So basically, I got four players for one and a little bit of money in the in the coffers, which was pleasing to the club. Um, but that would, I genuinely believed that was the only way we were going to get to the the playoffs. I had a good player in Paul Kitson, but I needed something. I needed to boost the squad. I needed the squad to be better. It was a big decision, not one that went down overly well, I have to say. Um, but ultimately, it was the right decision, I think, to try and take the club on quickly. That was the important thing, you know. Well, I think so. You, you just mentioned four players who, who still sit very nicely in most fans' memories yeah. in there. Uh, obviously, in particular, Simon Grayson, Simon Whitlow, Phil, you know, great players who yeah. went on to, you know, perform really well. I think it was a great deal. The, the final, I don't want to linger too much on, on the defeat, David Speedy clearly died. We all saw it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that took us on in, into the next season, though, where, you know, sometimes a defeat like that can knock the stuffing out. But it seemed to, we just, again, carried on towards another yeah. playoff semi final. I remember which was P- Portsmouth. Yeah. Away. Portsmouth. I remember, I remember when we lost the final. I remember we'd done a little bit of homework on who'd been in finals before and what their preparation was like for the next season. And, a lot of them had decided to give their team a little extra week off. And we said, look, I tell you what, lads, we've spoken to them before the game. Whatever happens, we are back in on July the 1st. Well, Whatever league we're in, we're back in. You're having three to four weeks breather and we're back at work. So each time that happened, we, we got our feet firmly on the ground. Everybody knew that whatever happened, we had a, we had a programme in place for the pre-season, for the next season. We weren't going to let anybody have extra time off or anything like that at all because they'd done well or whatever. So so our mentality was good. The players' mentality was good. Uh, the the season after, obviously, the, the playoff, again, I think we did very well against Swindon in that season again, you know. Uh, so so that was a, a bit of a blow as well. But Hoddle was fantastic in that game, um, who, you know, really was... And he left after the game to go to yeah. Chelsea, really, which was a bit of a gutter. But, um, yeah, that was... Uh, a major disappointment, and um, I think we felt we had a great chance that particular day. Um, and I remember people like Steve Thompson were just unconsolable at the end of the game. Really? It, was, it was really hard to take. But once again, we went in the dressing room and just looked at everybody straight in the eyes after about 20 minutes and said, look, back July the 1st, we're going again. We're going to be ready for it. Um, but we had a great bunch of players. They were lovely to work with. They were very honest. Um, and John Allen and myself, uh, tried to lead very much from the front. We joined in as much as we could, even the pre-season. We, we tried to do as much as we could with them running around, you know. So we, we were very, a very tough, a very tight group of people together, really. Yeah, I mean, that, that Swindon match, again, I, I think sometimes in life, Brian, you need, you need to taste the bitterness sometimes to taste the sweetness, <laughs> which was to come. Like, sadly, it's the yeah. way life goes. But that Swindon yeah. game was, for yeah. many Leicester fans... Was was still classed as one of our the most exciting games as a Leicester fan we've ever been to. It just didn't quite swing right for us at the end. It felt yeah, like it was it going was, to at three all. Yeah, it, I know at three three. I think you know we genuinely felt we had the big momentum to go forward. We made one little mistake and 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 uh, got punished for it. I think extra time we would have won without a doubt. I'm quite convinced of that. Although that'll never be proven. Um, it was just that 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 
perhaps a little bit of we're going to win now sort of feeling rather than hang on a sec let's just let's just get the 90 minutes out of the way you know and occasionally you see it many times in football not exactly the same circumstance but oh this team's going to win and then all of a sudden they get sucker punched and I think that's what happened to us that day unfortunately until we are going to come on, obviously, to the Silence of the Lambs game in a minute, as it's famously known in Leicester. Aggie wants to ask you, Aggie Frith says, how good was Julian Joachim as a player? Uh, well, good enough for me to take him away from Leicester as well. Yes. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> um, no, little JJ, when he was young, was was vibrant. He was just, uh, he, he didn't know what he had himself. He, he didn't realise how quick he was. I remember training one day, and I used to do a little trick with the players. We'd run up the hill and I'd turn around and run back and shout to them, anybody behind me before you get past a certain post is doing 50 press-ups, you know, and, <laughs> and, I, and I turned and went and I could still run in those days. Yeah. And all of a sudden, this little fella comes flying past me and I'm going, who's that? And it was little JJ, you know, he, he was so quick and I, nobody else was anywhere near him. He was, and I remember then thinking, I've got to be able to utilise that pace somehow. Um, he was very raw. Very, very raw. He scored two of the best goals I've ever seen at Leicester City. Uh, the one at Barnsley. Bar in the Barnsley, Cup, yeah. And, and the one at Pete, at the one against Portsmouth at, at the Forest Ground. Yes. Those were two goals that stick in my mind every time I think about JJ. Um, great little fella. Um, still speak to him now occasionally. Um, I, but he was a major you... talent, major talent. He just didn't really know what he had, in all fairness. He's just a really happy go lucky, easy going kid, really. I think, is he still playing from time to time, Brian? <laughs> yeah, I think does. he is, isn't he? I think he does. He plays in yeah. one of the local leagues in, in Lincolnshire, in either around the Lincoln area or might even be around the Leicestershire area. But he's certainly he's certainly still busy and still playing football. He, yeah, he's, uh, he's he, well, fit as can be, isn't he, really? Yeah. Yeah. Talking, talking of players who you, you took on as well, Brian, we've got Ben Morgan says, I think you took Simon Grayson as well and Mark Draper off us. Yeah. I, I remember I signed Simon at Leicester. I always... Sometimes you see players who you think you're going to sign. I remember being co youth coach at Middlesbrough. We played Leeds United and Gary Speed and a lot of other players were playing for, for Leeds at that time. And yet Simon Grayson stuck out for me as a youth coach. And I remember thinking one day, I'm going to sign that lad one day. And I kept tabs on him ever since I saw him playing the Leeds youth team. Um, to the point that when I was at Leicester, I just knew his, he was the sort of person I needed at the club. Uh, so the chance when the chance came to sign him, um, I, I took him with me. Larry, as I call him, is a great yeah. friend of mine. Um, uh, he offered me a couple of jobs to work with him later on in life. I couldn't take them at the time because of the other commitments. So that was pretty sad for me. I'd love to have worked with him. Um, but yeah, he was a, he was a, people didn't realize how much of a talker and an influence he was on the field. He talked and played football, which I always think is a, is a massive talent to have. If you can play and talk to people at the same time about what they should be doing, what you should be doing, where you're going to put the ball. He was a talker, and that that that's a great talent to have. A lot of people are very quiet when they play football and afterwards say, oh, I thought you were going to do this. But Simon Larry Grayson was one who said, here's the ball, take it on, turn, whatever. All the little things that make you a better player, he did. So I was very keen to sign him, very, very keen. We chatted with him a couple of weeks ago, and, and he's he, like you say, he's he talks at such a good game, so knowledgeable, yeah. and he's he's gone on to have his own very impressive yeah. managerial career. Um, yeah. Coming coming back to the obviously the next season after the Swindon one, you've mentioned Julian Joachim away again. I was I was in, stood in the Trent end at that <laughs> yeah. playoff game, which was an experience to be in our local yes. rivals' terracing. Um, yes. But again, a gr because Filbert Street was effectively being knocked down at, or mm. some of the Carling stand was being built. Yes. A, gr a great playoff victory against, a again, Portsmouth were a good side at that moment. Well, I, 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 I can't remember how many points they finished above us, but they certainly finished enough points to be very bitter about the playoffs, I guess. Yeah. And sometimes sometimes the playoffs do that to you. You know, sometimes it's, um, I, again, I my memory i'd have to look at results again but i always think we finished seasons quite well yes. we finished sometimes with like nine games unbeaten eight games unbeaten and we went into the playoffs with great momentum each time you know and and that was something which which stood us in good stead um uh, i think we lost at newcastle 7-1 once which <laughs> was that the last I'm, I'm trying to think if that was before the derby game but um but generally speaking, we finished the season well and we went into the playoffs with momentum every single time sort of thing, you know. So um, we always felt we had a chance. Portsmouth were 
a better side in than us in terms of the whole season. But we were ready to play them. And, um, you know, we, we did ever so well to get a good draw at their place, a difficult place to play. Um, and I think Tomo got probably the equaliser there, if my memory serves me right. Um, Stevie Thompson always told me he, he was the best player I ever signed, which <laughs> make, always makes me laugh. <laughs> so yeah. he's such a, it's, but that's the sort of character he was. That's he what was you brilliant, are, yeah. in the, brilliant in the dressing room. Um, I had, a, you know, as I say, some, some wonderful players there, not just on the field of play, off the field of play. David Oldfield, Phil, Phil G with our two comedians. They were just so funny. They lived, they had their own chat. I mean, you know, you're reliving lots of memories now uh, yeah. talking about it. Um, but, but um, yeah, Tom always was, was excellent. The, there was a group of people who, who really um, stood out at that club. It was right. It was the right place for them to play. We're going to talk about the Silence of the Lambs, the 94 player. I mean, for me, I, I'm perhaps upset some Leicester fans and say it in my 44 years of watching Leicester, that's the best game ever. Leicester um, against Derby yeah. just but had I, everything we wanted. Yeah, I think if I'd lost the game, I might have got the sack, though, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> really? when, you, when you think of the team I picked, I mean, it, it was, I remember Colin Gibson, that's three Colin all the time obviously he still does hospitality at Leicester all the time Colin Gibson but he's he's obviously an Aston Villa man as well but yeah Colin Colin said to me I still can't believe you picked me that day you know I, I still can't believe and you know Walshy up front with Ormond Droid and and uh, uh and Big Ewan Roberts so pro three three big lads yeah um you know we had Jimmy Willis Gary Coates with another centre back at right back you know we it was the biggest strongest toughest team I could pick really uh, with Mark Blake and little Gibbo in the middle of the far park who, who could rat around people and make it difficult for them. Um, I, I decided that, you know, the playoffs were fun. But sometimes you've got to pick a team to win a game of football. Yeah. And I didn't think we could outplay Derby. I, I really didn't. I, I felt it was the sort of occasion that they would have thrived on. And in fairness, Tommy Johnson had two or three great opportunities to score. I know he scored one, but... Um, he had two or three good opportunities to, to have won the game for, for Derby. But it was a massive gamble, the team. Um, it wasn't announced until the breakfast the morning of the game. And I, I, I know Walshy on a, several occasions, I've, I've seen him written in written uh, words that he still couldn't believe the team Brian Little picked against Derby <laughs> County. Well, I mean... Um, He'd been Walshy himself had been fairly injured leading up to it, hadn't he? Oh, yeah, he was, I, you he, know, I mean, he was nowhere it, near fit. Yeah. No, I mean it was the stuff of like gladiatorial type <laughs> things to I mean, but what 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 was going through your mind when you thought I am just gonna put Steve Walsh up front for this final? I put Walsh uh, sticks and and uh, and Ewan up front. Um I ended up taking Ewan off and putting JJ on, which made a difference, of course. But I just felt I had to threaten them. I had I had to make them think, wow, what are we playing against today? You know, if it had been uh, Wembley, let's play football against each other. Let's see who's the best passing team. Let's see who's going to... I just think they had the edge on us. I genuinely felt they were... They had a really... Good, and I signed two or three of their lads afterwards, you know? So, um, yeah. I, I thought they were a really good team. I, I still think anybody who analyses that... People don't analyse the team because I won. Yeah. But I think, you know, my players... My, my own players afterwards had said to me, why did you pick that team? How did you pick that team? And I think on reflection, if I'd picked that team and we'd lost sort of three or four nil, people would have gone, he's lost the plot, you know, he's, he's yeah. gone. So, but it, it worked and, and management does that to you. You know, you make, you have defining moments. I call it a defining moment in football when you pick a team that people look at and go, oh, what's that? I, I, I look at other managers in over the years who, who did defining things. Like I remember H Rudd Hullick uh, dropping Alan Shearer. And I'm thinking, yeah. whoa, that's that's a big decision. And if it doesn't work, you've had it. And it, it actually does happen that way. And I've I've had a few of those decisions myself, you know, over the years where you make a big decision uh, and, and you fall because of it. But that's the name of the game. That's why you're in that job, you know. And or it was in those days. I think yeah. it's slight it's slightly different now. Everything I I did everything. I had John and Alan to help me, of course. But I think they would tell you that. Ultimately, I would always say, them, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing this. You, you know, don't try and influence me anymore because that's what I'm doing. Whereas today, I think they're, they're far more studious. They'll they, they, they perhaps sit on the fence a little bit. Yes. I don't think the Mourinho's and I don't think the, the, the top managers at the big, big, big clubs need to sit on the fence. But I think a lot of other people have got a lot of issues and need to be very careful about making big decisions these days. It's quite difficult. But back in the day, it was just, 
you just had to do what you felt was right yourself, you know. Well, well, Brian, you might be interested to know that I can't even work out how many years 1994 ago was from now. It was a <laughs> little while. But we still on Leicester Fan TV, even now when Brendan Rodgers is picking a team or we're losing 1-0, the fan debate still goes and says, let's put Walsh up front. We did it then. Yeah. We can do it again. If we're losing, why why not gamble it for the last five minutes? You know, put Wes Morgan well, the thing up was there. With Steve Walsh, Steve Walsh never practiced playing centre half. You know, whatever game we were playing, he <laughs> genuinely wanted to be he wanted to just tap it in. And while she was it, Walsh's temperament was the sort of thing that I could handle. I think a lot of managers would have said, no, you get at the back and you're doing this, which would which would have upset them to a degree, to the point yeah. that he probably would have took a couple of days off and turned up on a Saturday for the game. You know, <laughs> He didn't like training that much, Walsh, unless he was allowed to play in a, in a small-sided game up front. So I loved all that. I liked that. I, I'm, I'm quite, I was quite easy with people, but you know, big enough to make decisions against them. Um, but I think my man management was really good in those days with the likes of Walshy. Yeah. Um, we had a few problems, you know, obviously whenever he met Stevie Bull, it was always going to crack up. It was always going to be <laughs> so, something, exci something some exciting things. going on. But, but Walshy was probably one of the best finishers at the club, without a doubt. And, and because of his knee injury, I, I think, you know, runners would have caused him all sorts of problems. So he was as brave as a lion for me. Um, you know, I think in the, now, this modern day, the physiotherapists and the sports scientists wouldn't have let him play football at that point. They would have said, "Look, no, you're gonna you're gonna hurt yourself." In our day, it was all about waiting till the morning of the game. Look at the adrenaline; you could almost see the adrenaline running through Walshy. And where on a Friday he'd turn around and he said, "Gaffer, I'm struggling." Saturday morning, I'd say, "How are you, son?" "Oh, I'm ready. I'm, I want to play. Yeah, I want to do it. I want to play." So it was just just one of those things which. Again, an era allows you to get away with little things like that. And obviously, that that win at Wembley, Brian, I think was seventh. Was we all called it seventh heaven, seventh mm. time Leicester have been to Wembley and never. And we finally, finally yes. came away with a win. Yeah, I didn't you know. really, again until I heard until not recently, but until I watched commentary on it and things like that. That wasn't something I was totally aware. I, I didn't realise yeah. we we hadn't won there. Um, and 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 that in itself strengthened my decision to try and play that way. Um, yeah, uh, you know. But having said that, the substitutions were probably the turn of the game, really. When little Julian came on, um, uh, I think Tomo came on as well, didn't he? Simon Grayson went to right back and crossed the ball for the for the goal. Um, yeah, yeah. Lots of little, all the little things that you need to work for you as a manager on that day went perfectly well. It was it was a great day out for us all. Fantastic. And then obviously we've already alluded to it after the following season. And, and I'm, we know you've got the massive affinity with Aston Villa. I, yeah. I'm going to ask the question, but I assume when Villa came knocking, it was fairly straightforward decisions to go there. No, not, not totally. I have to say I spoke with Martin George a few times. I, I was very torn because I was happy. I, I, loved the, I loved where I was. I enjoyed my work. Basically, I think when, when I went and sat down with Alan Evans and John Gregory, so there's the massive Villa connection Yeah. There. And and John, I remember John saying to me, look, uh, Brian, you know, if you don't take this now, you might not ever get the offer yes. again. Um, and I think that's, you know, that, that, was, that was the thing that swung it. It was Aston Villa. It was something that I'd, I'd been there from a 15-year-old kid. I'd been an apprentice. I'd played in the first team. I had to retire there. They looked after me. I worked in the club shop. I became the youth coach. Um, Destiny might have said, you know, one day I might go there. I mean, years on again now I'm now a, an ambassador for the club and I'm yeah. I, you know I've been there for sort of nearly 30 years of my life um I I just I just got to the point where I thought you know what you're right the problem was in those days it was there was nothing written for compensation clauses or anything I think people like myself and many other managers in the 90s who who either wanted to go or on the other side of the coin, if the club wanted to get rid of you, you know, you were in a court case and it was crazy, really. You know, yeah. so if you, if you were sacked, if you were sacked, there was always two sides to the coin. If I'd have been sacked at Leicester because we didn't do very well that season, you know, I, I would have been in a court case trying to get a little bit of money for compensation for losing my job. Yeah. So I think, I think those, that era has, has been very important for football in terms of, Making the club and the manager, the club and a player, fully aware of what the what the what the future holds. If it's a if it's a move 
there's a compensation cause in place. It was very lucky. It wasn't enjoyable. It really hurt me. I was very disappointed. And um, I still to this day see the sun with Judas on uh, every now and again flashing in my head. You know, the, the day I went back to Leicester and, and yes. I got a call at seven o'clock in the morning off a reporter who said to me, have you seen the Sun newspaper? I said, no, I don't really read the newspapers. He said, get the Sun. And I got the Sun and it had my picture with Judas. And I, I mean, I just, it, it, I, I don't tell a lie, it hurt. I mean, it really, yeah. really hurt me. Um, but that was how it was in those days. And I had to get on with it. That was pretty much the first time I'd really, really had stick in my life, you know, on a national level. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I still, every now and again, have this little flashback, I have yeah. to say. To but, that, you know, if it, if, it's, I guess, if, if it it was difficult, it, but that's just the way it was, I'm afraid. No, and I think, like you say, it's local rivalry, and that sometimes that's what football's about, isn't it? Yeah. Having a bit of spite yeah. into it. Um, you yeah. went on, you went on, Brian, and you man, you managed several other, you know, big clubs, Stoke, West Brom, Hull. Yeah. But but now, you, you again, you said earlier you were 66. Is there no... no you know, not not one more managerial role, or is it? No, don't want I don't, to do it anymore. I don't see managerial role. I, I I don't I don't see that. I I probably made a couple of wrong decisions in my life. I went back down to the bottom. I wanted to I wanted to feel what it was like again at the bottom. And I think when I did that, people probably got the impression that he he, he didn't really want to do want it to. anymore. Yeah. Um, but I think, and that, so I went and did. I had four brilliant years in television, working in uh, working abroad, doing the European. Uh, Cup, uh, Champions League games, Premier League games, and I really enjoyed the research that I had to do. That so I've always watched football. I've always watched different types of football. The last four years, I've been back at Aston Villa in 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 a, in a sort of ambassadorial role. So I go to every single game. I mean, the lockdown is is hurting me as much as anybody. I can't yeah. you know watch football, um, but I've watched Aston Villa for the last four years in the Championship and now in the Premier League. Uh, so I'm still watching, still learning. I still I don't think there's a managerial role in there for me I, I think you know some sort of um perhaps a mentor or or someone who's you know surround around a younger manager helping him through perhaps yeah. that might be something that might come my way but um a director of football manager, maybe somewhere well i think again that's 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 a massive role yeah um I, i'm not i i to be honest i i miss football i miss the day-to-day -day thing i i genuinely say that um but at the same time I'm working at a club that I really like, I love, I've got a great passion for. You know, I, I go up and down the country watching them play. Um, it's a great job. It's a lovely yeah. job. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, it's a difficult one. I, I, I do miss it. If the opportunity came my way, I'm quite sure I would say yes, but I've no, I never put myself out there. I don't put myself out. I've never tried to, to get a job for the last five or six years, never been, never applied for anything. And I think that's something you have to do nowadays. Um, so, so um, never say never. I, never, never. I don't. I genuinely don't think I'll be a football manager again. I think someday I will go back into football, or I hope I would go back into football in some more of a full time role than I am at the moment. I would enjoy that. I think for sure. Uh, I've got one final question before we let you go, <laughs> Brian. Because trust me, I could speak for hours with you, but I've got to let you go. Um, <laughs> Gray, Gray um, asks, sorry, it was Aggie actually asks, and he, I, I just wanted to ask before you go, Villa, I've seen Villa play obviously a few times against Leicester this season with the semi-finals uh, of the League Cup, which we really yeah. won't talk about. They've got some good players there. Obviously, you've got your Jack Grealish's target I like as a player, Samata, Pepe Reina, isn't it? And go, have, have they got, have you got enough to stay up? Well, I think the, the one person you should ask about is the manager, in fairness. I think uh, the last thing he wants is me coming on television in any oh, yeah. shape, on shape or form and, and saying he should do this or they should do that or I think they'll do this or I think that. That's always a topic that I've avoided. I think uh, being a, having been a manager before as well, uh, sure. the last thing you want is other people at the club saying what should happen. I love Aston Villa. Wherever, the, wherever we end up at the end of this season, I will still be very much supportive of them. Uh, I like Dean. He's a great person. We've got a good team. Um, uh, we've we've been a little bit unfortunate in some of the games, but that's what the Premier League's all about. It's ruthless, you know. So um, it we'll is see. tough. It's a it great is tough. Club. 
Yeah. I know I know most Leicester fans well, we've got this love hate relationship with Villa. Yeah. We'd sort of <laughs> yes. we'd sort of quite like to see them go down, but personally I'd like to see them stay up. I know a lot of Leicester fans would because we love the local derbies, just like we'd yeah. like to see Forest and Derby come up if they can make it. Because we like to have a bit of local rivalry. The East the East Midlands and Midlands yeah, has, has been a so. bit lacking with it's, it's I think it's healthy to have those sort of games. They're great for everybody. The fans love it. It's a simple one to get to and uh, the atmosphere is always fantastic. It always is. Brian, it's been absolutely a pleasure to have you on Leicester Fan TV. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. It's great to speak to you. Thanks again. Thank you. Letting Brian go there. Thanks again to Brian Little. Absolutely. That was a massive pleasure of mine to speak with him. Genuinely, when I say it, those games, that Blackburn playoff final, that the Swindon final, even though we lost... What what a game that was. What emotions. That was absolutely amazing. And then, of course, the Derby game, the playoff, the, the seventh heaven, the game, the Silence of the Lambs. It doesn't get any better than that. Um, I should have asked Brian. Keith just put that on there and I should have asked him that. Brian, can you start the wave? Um, Ross says we look a bit like long lost brothers. I tell you what, Brian Little looks absolutely amazing for 66. Um Phil has took over it. I genuinely was. There was times there I was struggling because he was he was a brilliant. Like Paul is saying, what a lovely gentleman. He really was. Joanna, thank you for that. Could have spot, could have honestly spoken to Brian Little for so long. I feel sad for Tom, who's missed that one. Um, and I've stepped in for him at last minute, but it's been absolutely amazing. Thanks for all your comments. I tried to get as many in as possible tonight. It's not always easy to get them all in. Because of uh, Brian was a great talker, so getting his questions in was fantastic. Um, don't forget, if you are watching us, uh, wherever you're watching us, follow us at Leicester Fan TV. Subscribe to us. Uh, tomorrow night's show is uh, a fan zone special with Locks and Josh, some of the longer, younger Leicester fan content people. So do do join them at 7:30. They'll be starting to look forward to the Bournemouth game. Um, I know results. I, I hear Wolves have lost tonight. That might have done us a bit of a favour. So um, keep the faith. Bournemouth on Saturday. Thanks to all the guys at ADT, Eat Me, Tiger from Everard's, Peter's Pizzas, Leicester Garage uh, Conversions, Piglet's Pantry, The Fox's Arms, Pink Car Leasing, Hologram, and the charity that we love to support, which is Memphis. But most of all, thanks for all your comments. Um, we couldn't do the show without the fans, so please thank yourselves for joining us. For my name is Phil. This is Leicester Fan TV. I'm stuttering and losing the plot because that was just brilliant talking to the one and only Brian Little. Get on!